Evening, everyone. Not Sounds like I'm talking to a huge crowd here. Yeah. For the benefit of those of you at home, there's about eight of us here. Right? Uh, yes, thanks to uh, Rail Strike. There's not that many of us here. Our original speaker has pulled out, uh, but we'll be hearing from him probably in February. And said, Lucas very kindly jumped in um, with a talk that I have no idea what it's about. Somebody with architecture, and that's about it. Um, before we kick off. Uh, on Friday, uh, Luca is, has organised one of his black tie bar meets, whatever you would call it. Um, this time in a place called Fitz's in the, what's the name of the hotel? Kimpton Fitzroy. The Kimpton Fitzroy Hotel, Russell, Russell Street. Um, of course, the place will be full of other punters who aren't wearing black tie, which is a very good reason for us to turn up in black tie. So, I think that's about it. Oh, there's, there's a kind of like a Halloween thing on the 28th, if you fancy it. That's about all I can think of what's going on. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Luca. Bravo! <laughs> so, um, some of you may have seen the presentation we did about Christopher Alexander and the nature of order. And he had an intellectual air that I actually think took his work uh, forward quite, quite effectively and perhaps more empirically, in a more empirically robust way, and that's Professor Salingaros, and he wrote a theory of architecture. But before I go into that, I want to um, just mention briefly what we mean by life in this context, because complexity is kind of obvious. Life is a term from Christopher Alexander, and what he meant by it simply, it's kind of a portmanteau term, when applied to a built space, as just buildings and urban space that makes you feel at ease and happy and that you enjoy. So imagine you go to a little square in some little town you know, in Spain with whitewashed buildings, he would say that place has life. And if you go in a uh, ruthless car park at night and you're feared for your life, uh, that is a building in an environment that doesn't have life. Um, so all this material is drawn from this book by Nico Saligaros. Um, about it, and, and the idea is he's a physicist and a, and a mathematician, and uh, as I say, he's an intellectual heir really to Christopher Alexander. And the idea is that he wanted to establish um, some objective empirical bases for the art theoretical and the, and the aesthetic aspects of architecture. Obviously, the tectonic bits, the engineering bits, are very empirical. That's why buildings mostly don't fall down and mostly don't leak. But the, the aesthetics, the looks, you know, the, the idea of why we're going to build it in this way with this material, other than it won't fall down, um, what uh, the bit that starts when where engineering ends, that's generally been regarded as something that's a personal taste or very much a humanities kind of subject. You know, I like this, you like that. And he was trying to establish something a little bit more scientifically based. Now, the basic premise, or you know, even trying to do that, which not everyone agrees with, is this idea that um, you know, our brains are wired a certain way and certain aesthetics, certain way of organizing um, physical space is visually and cognitively, uh, it brings ease. And, and that is good for us uh, you know, psychologically, physically, and it's good for society and so forth. So it's a very positivist approach. And the idea is if you understand how the brain works, you understand how cognitive visual coherence works, and from that, you can derive rules uh, that aren't, you know, you have to be, you know, this wall has to be red, but it may be that you need to have some color contrast, for instance, and so forth. And so they, and then these rules or, or these, uh, these guidelines would help you to build life into a building, interior and exterior, and indeed in a city or a neighborhood, in a way that is sustainable. Now, there's a ton of work before we get to the bit that we're going to talk about today in terms of establishing all the neuroadaptive aspects. You know, why is it that, I'll give you an example, curved lines bring life to a building? Um, I didn't want to cover all that because I think, um, well, it would just take a, a lot of time and, and maybe perhaps not everyone would be very interested in it. So we're, gonna, we're going to take that as a given, that these 
these characteristics that we're going to talk about aren't just made up of whole cloth. You know, they, they, you know Professor Sangaz didn't just make this stuff up. It's based on some fairly hard science. And perhaps we'll come back another day and talk about that. But in the meantime, he comes up with three laws of structural order. There's order on the small scale, and that's basically created by what we might call detail, uh, you know, to be very, very brief. So contrasting elements, paired, intertwined, um, the bounding of voids and limits in a building. And then there's large scale order, a you know, whole building. And that's legibility, I call it. You know, things like symmetry or, or, or different bits mirroring each other, things uniting across a building. And the third concept, which unites the small scale order and the large scale order, is the idea that there's more than one scale. So imagine a building that's just one huge cube and has one scale. If it has windows, which are smaller than the cube, by definition, it would have two scales. If it had further divisions, like say it may have two wings, that would have three scales, and so on and so forth. And the idea that is that there's a certain way of ordering the scales that brings cognitive ease. And that's another presentation in its own. And that one has a, a, a fair number of formulas. So again, I've forgotten that, yeah, because I'll try not to bore the audiences too much. So laughing complexity in architecture. That's based on chapter five of that book. So going back to these laws of structural order, a couple of terms, life, represents a sense of ease, comfort, security, relaxation. We associate with a built form. We can perceive at the neurological level easily, and that gives us lots to look at, but not too much, and it's organized in such a way that we can absorb easily. And that stimulates our parasympathetic system. We mentioned that in one of the presentations some times back. The parasympathetic system is a system that works when things are running fairly smoothly. You know, when there's enough oxygen in the air, we're not drowning, and the tigers are chasing us. We've evolved. You know, it makes a lot of our functions uh, work without us thinking about it. The sympathetic system is the bit that makes us jump when we think we see a snake in the grass. Okay? Or well, we hear whooshing sounds behind us and we duck. And we need that. It's important. And some aspects of art and architecture uh, stimulate that. And if you have zero stimulus in the sympathetic system, we find things a bit boring, a bit dull. So if you like horror movies, you know, you're simulating a jump scare as the ultimate sympathetic system stimulus. If you're looking at a beautiful sun-dappled valley with nice flowers and children playing, whatever, that's a very sympathetic system. The sympathetic system, when in the field of architecture, thrives on complexity, on differences, on, on, on contrast. And the idea is to find some kind of balance between these. And so this, this, this part called life, the, the, the comfort, the ease, is based on, on two, two, two factors. One is what he calls temperature. He's a physicist. And so he's, he's drawing some analogies from, uh, from thermodynamics. Temperature and harmony. And harmony is defined as the opposite of entropy. So harmony is predictability, if you will. It's not arbitrariness in the organization of visual and aesthetic elements. And very importantly, none of these things are dependent on a specific style. So it's not the case that, uh, in his work, that you know, Gothic works better than Romanesque or uh, classical Hindu uh, or, or Moorish architecture. It, it's a specific ways in which they're organized and, and whether some elements are present or not, rather than, you know, oh, I like cottages, and therefore they are more like. <laughs> right? Not cottaging, cottages. <laughs> um, so, temperature, we've said temperature is about the structure of the smaller scales, and harmony is about the larger scale order. So life is simply, you just multiply. So there are, there are five characteristics of temperature. You can give a value of zero to two. So your temperature of a building or a facade or, or a room can be from zero to 10, same for harmony. So when you multiply them, that produces life. You can be from zero to 100. 100 is better, zero is very, very bad. Complexity is temperature times the absence of harmony. Uh, if something is very, very complex, so imagine a building that has lots of interesting bits, but they're, they're organized in such a way that it's difficult for your visual cortex processing 
to read them quickly and easily and, 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 and immediately, in fact, because it takes about, the first impression takes, is faster than the flinch. The reason you flinch sometimes is something like that. It's very difficult to hit someone in the eye without them blinking because it's really, really quick. Well, so the, the visual analysis is like hundreds of a second, okay? Um, if something is very organized in a very complex, unpredictable way, that creates a sort of weight, a sort of deficit, a, a cost to your neurological ease. So what are the different bits that make up temperature? Uh, and, we'll, and we'll give examples, by the way. We have lots of pictures coming up. Intensity of, per intensity of perceived detail, that means detail that you can, you can see, you can touch. Differentiation, curvature, color intensity, and color contrast. So you can add those up. And so we start with T1, which is the presence of small scale detail. And you can see these are some examples from India. Um, this is from the Middle Ages. This is obviously Jacobian strap work. It's Greco Roman. That is the Victorian. And that's vernacular um, Scandinavian. And this detail is not just the presence of small scale, as you can see in this grid work or in those um, uh, escutcheons, um, but it's empowered also, or rather magnified by the fact that they are intertwined. It's not just, if you just put a t lots of little tiny elephants on a completely flat surface, it's not as if the same as if they are contained within these fascia and these scrolls and so forth. And so, again, I mean, that could be a whole presentation, but this is considered very important in creating visual ease and interest for the eye and something, the way they describe it, something to hold on to from all kinds of different scales. Then we have differentiation. So you can see in these buildings, um, this is probably the best, easiest example, you have triangles and squares and rectangles and concave bits. So there's a lot of variety of shapes. Uh, you have very marked uprights and horizontals, the corniche and the, and the columns on the side. And this building too, it's got very powerful corniche. It is partly concave and convex. It has triangular and rounded forms. So there are a lot of different shapes in the building. If you remember, this can create both life but also complexity. So there's a trade-off there. It's not that the more complicated the building is, the better, okay? But, but this certainly creates life. It creates interest. Was that a question? No, I was, I was, I was this is a little bit about Clayton. Sorry. <laughs> My mission is to catch him out. So, <laughs> so again, you know, this is just to illustrate that this kind of variety of shapes, okay, this differentiation can occur in all kinds of different styles. Here you have a very classic Hindu temple. So, yes. And, and that's a church in Milan, you know, or early Renaissance church. Another thing that can create definition and differentiation are different textures, not colors, although in this case you have different colors as well. But this change of texture has a similar impact as having different shapes. Because again, it's not like one floor is identical to the other, but this is very roughly rusticated and this is a much more smooth surface. And here you're going from some kind of limestone to this black brick. And again, it's independent of the style. It's just the presence of this or not. Curvature in Gestalt theory, which is a theory about how our visual perception works, is apparently very important. It's probably because it has some degree of naturalistic or organicist appeal. So curvature in buildings, domes, sweeping bits, tends to create life and interest uh, in a measurable way. Um, and again, you can see it you know, in, in Hudson's City Opera House, Agia Sophia, and, and St. Paul's, and lots of different buildings. Of course, intensity of hue. You know, color is uh, largely um, underappreciated as an element in architecture for a number of historical reasons. Um, not least the fact that before uh, <coughs> the 19th century, it was difficult to produce lasting color that didn't wash away in buildings. Uh, although people in 2000 BC seem to be able to manage that. But uh, that's an important, or why they can add light. And so is contrast of color. But we'll see later in another slide, it doesn't matter, color doesn't mean any colors paired together. There must be colors that set each other off. As you can see in this building, 
in uh, um, near Regent Street in London. And this is in, um, I believe, in uh, it's a modernismo building in, uh, in, in Barcelona and so forth. And obviously, that's an Art Deco building. So kind of complementary colors working with each other. And all these rules apply to the exterior of buildings, but also if you're looking at the interior. So obviously here you have lots of different shapes, lots of different colors. You, here you have less life in a, in a sense, although I actually prefer this building, uh, or, or highly prize it, because obviously there's just one color, right? It's all limestone. It has lots of other elements. It has curvature, uh, differentiation, detail, blah, blah, blah. So this would grade quite highly on the temperature scale. So we've looked at temperature and the other element of life or appreciability of a building or a built space is harmony. And this is where we talk about the organization of the elements. All these elements that we talked about before are, are single things. You can have a lot of it or less of it, uh, but we haven't talked about how they're distributed over the built space. So the first thing is the idea that you have lots of symmetries. You have clearly a singular symmetry here, but then all the other elements in there are also symmetric. And if you have this on a bunch of different scales, you would give this a two for this building and that building. If you have non-orthogonal, i.e. non-straight line symmetries, um, that the neurological research tends to indicate have the opposite effect. They don't bring harmony, they create disharmony. So if you put, you know, there is no symmetry here. The, the, the windows are kind of basically almost randomized, right? This is a famous deconstructivist building. Um, that makes it much less legible. Because what we can't do is image compression in your brain. You can't say, oh, there's this window here, and then it just repeats, and then this window is a bit different, but it repeats. No, they're all in completely different places. The building on the left is one of a pair. Yes. So the symmetry, yeah, the dotted line was confusing, confusing isn't because it matches on the other side. As we all know in antiques, you get more for a pair. So there is less. The two buildings think. together have a sort of triangular yeah. shape. Sure, you look at one individually, I'm with you. But uh, um, they're not identical buildings, you'll recall. So they're, they're, not, they're not the same, the building. It, it, it has that, that slant. I used to have a very good client, actually, there. You, this is, you take the, the, the lift here. You see? The lift shaft is marked here. Because uh, obviously you can't make lifts go to one, I suppose you could. But that you go straight up. You've not been in the uh, Great Arch in St. Louis, the lift goes by. Like, uh, that, that, that must be interesting. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It must be possible, but it's a lot more complicated. Whereas this one, you, you, you get on this side, and then you, go the, you have to get on that side because you, know, you see the shape of the building. And again, you know, the entire Pisa has this kind of um, sympathetic effect, right? It's kind of surprising because you know, things aren't supposed to lean that way. Um, and, and you know people wouldn't want it to be completely straightened because it's famous for being lean and, and of course the fact in this case wasn't intentional right that it was a problem with the with, with the weight relative to the subsoil um, but you know it can exist in all kinds of different styles and you can see here in this case that you know you could say that there's a very basic symmetry of just each but there aren't a lot of different repeated elements with it um, Another thing that is um, considered to bring harmony is the repetition of distinct elements. What I mean, what is meant by that, that you see in this building, it's got columns here on, on the ground floor, then the, this set of windows are more or less identical to each other, but they're different from these uh, bronze frame ones. And again, it differs here and here and here. So on the one hand, you don't have the same undiluted thing all the way up, but then, once you've read this bit, the brain can say, okay, this bit continues like that. And that can be both vertical and horizontal. And you can have that in modern buildings, right? in this particular building, which I think is a library uh, or, or an art gallery. You know, it's got these very bold, overarching projections. And you know, they're quite different from the basic glass building contained within. And they repeat as do, as do the glass panels. Another aspect of harmony, and again, harmony is just about legibility, helping our brain take in what is a big, complex thing relatively more easily without losing all those other elements like details that we talked about. 
And one of the most interesting to me is fractality, this idea that certain shapes are repeated. So this is a famous Warmer Noviator, and it's got a lot of triangles in it, right? And so that apparently, demonstrably, you know, even doing MRI tests, showing people pictures, although it's a very complex building, the fact that the peaks and the, and the triangles and the steep um, slopes are repeated at a similar shape helps us process that. H4 is regular structures that span different elements. You see these giant columns go over several stories. This is quite a large element that, again, projects above the building. And very importantly, on the horizontal, the corniche wraps around the entire building. You can wrap around the whole building, even though there are projections and res recesses in the articulation, that one thing unites the whole thing. And then there's color harmony. We talked about color before, how it can create interest in life, but the degree to which it's harmonized also can create more or less complexity. So if you look at number one poultry, which many people hate and some people like, but clearly there are two different shades of a warm color, and I would say they're fairly complementary. These are kind of random. They don't really repeat. There isn't a pattern to it. Okay, So it's like a, cof a cacophony of, of, of color. And so the research indicates that this gives a sense of lack of harmony. Some examples. Um, you know, let's look at some buildings in the whole. All of these buildings are within a few blocks of each other. That part of the city, you might recall, has a number of um, streets built during the Victorian period that cut through all the streets. And so it creates a lot of lots that are wedge-shaped. So there are lots of wedge-shaped buildings. Uh, and it's interesting to compare them because they're, they're very different in period and in style. So you have the National Provincial Bank of 20, 1929, the National Safe Deposit Building, which incidentally, when it was a safe deposit building, it had this insane system of security for the basement. It would flood if, some, if it caught fire, had like a flooding system. It, it, it was basically safer than the Bank of England, other than the fact that the Bank of England has soldiers in it. Number one poultry, which is a very controversial building and probably one of the most iconic postmodern buildings in this country. It's rather non-distinct 60 Queen Victoria Street. The Canet Lyonnais building, also along that street, which at the time was, you know, well liked by modernist critics. And the other buildings of 1871, which were built together with Queen Victoria Street, and are, you know, very historicizing, uh, so Romanesque revival type buildings. So how, do, how, do, how can we grade these based on these factors that we've just talked about? So in terms of small detail, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each individual building. But the National Provincial Bank has some lovely detail, but also a lot of fairly blank or repetitive surfaces. The National Safe Deposit has detail all over. Number one, poultry doesn't really have small scale details. It's got a lot of large scale detail, but it doesn't have any carvings or anything smaller than you know, a couple of meters high. Same with Queen Victoria Street and Credit Yone because that is the very ethos of functionalist to minimalist modernism. And the Avalor Buildings is basically made up of detail. Now, texture uh, diversification, you have quite a bit in, in, in the National Provincial. You, you change the type of stone. Um, you know, you have different levels and so on and so forth. Same with safe deposit. And poultry does too, number one poultry, right? I mean, you, you have these big, very bold bands. You have expanses of glass, and then you have stone cladding. Queen Victoria Street is pretty much, I mean, you have glass and metal panels, but the glass and metal panels are exactly the same color, and they're made to look very similar. So from a distance, it just looks like one giant lump. The Cris de Lyonnais, to their credit, made these kind of prefabricated metal arches very clearly separate from the plain glass. And they have these kind of sweeping, you know, pseudo corniche in a different color, in a different material. And again, the other buildings has a lot of diversification of elements. Rounded shapes. It's not really a round building. There's a nice kind of concave the chamfered corner there is slightly concave. And there are some um, arched openings, so we give that a one out of two. Same with the National Safe Deposit. I mean, it's got a concave corner. But other than that, it's not very, very wide well building. This one, uh, number one poultry, you know, it has this sort of like submarine turret kind of thing. And, and, and you know, 
it feels like quite a round building. Uh, this is also drum shape, this part. We went to our suite and this has no real rounded bits. For the UNA, because of the way the, 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 um, the horizontal elements have been created, it makes it look rounder than it is, so we give it a good one. And same with the Albert buildings. In terms of color, most of those buildings are monochrome. Um, the two exceptions are Queen Victoria Street, which is kind of greenish, mottled effect, and poultry is very colorful, number one poultry. So if you add them all up, it's interesting to do that. If you do that experiment with some buildings you like, some buildings you don't like, um, you know, you get some fairly different, so you start with National Provincial Bank, which I quite like. It doesn't have a very high temperature, four and a half. National Safe Deposit a bit higher, poultry, Never one poultry has got you know, off, the, off the scale, it's quite high. And so do the Oliver buildings. And then the Victor 60 Victoria Street and Credit Lyonnais are quite low on the temperature scale. They don't really give you a lot to look at. How about Harmony? So the National Provincial Bank has lots of look as, as Harmony. It, this is important because that's one thing that Professor Sangaros corrected me on. Uh, he was very nice and he looked at part of this presentation some, some weeks ago and I had gotten this wrong. The idea of this is that you have to have symmetry, but not just in one scale, in repeated smaller scales. So I would say National Provincial, full two, same with National Deposit, almost all historicist buildings score two. Number one poultry is clearly um, um, has a mirror symmetry around this bit, but other than that, has a lot of disjointed elements. Same with Queen Victoria Street and the UNA. And the other buildings even has a limited um, repetition of distinct elements. I don't want to belabor these too much because I think then you might get a bit bored, but you obviously get different scores. Then we have self-similarity and fractality. Not a lot of these buildings, even in some of these very, I think, nice old buildings, there isn't a lot of what I would call fractality. I mean, you have, you have the rectangle repeated, but you know, it's not a very powerful effect. I think the Credit Lyonnais actually is the one that's stronger. I may even give it a one and a half. In that, you know, you have increasing, slightly different scale of the arches. And, and the arch has a similar vertex as the curvature of, 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 the, of the prow of the building. So that could maybe even score slightly higher than one. Geometric connections, stronger in buildings that are big, both strong uprights and sideways. Elements that are not interrupted, see? Strong horizontal element, but then no, no, we don't have it here, okay. But there isn't really a strong upright to make up for that. So it's lacking that, um, and so on. And then you have color harmony. Well, it's easy to be harmonious if you have one color. I think poultry, despite the fact it's got these very broad bands, they're not colors that clash. And, uh, and so on. Okay. So again, we come up with some harmony scores, which are higher. Remember, National Provincial Bank, the life score was not off the chart, but it's very harmonious. And Albert Buildings had quite a high, a pretty high um, score for life, and that scores fairly well for harmony, and so on and so forth. And you can add that a lot for all the different buildings. They're all comparatively orderly buildings. There aren't any disconstructivist, completely mad buildings. So even the modernist ones score fairly high. You know, the problem with 60 Queen Victoria Street, it doesn't have a lot of unifying elements. So it doesn't have anything that's completely unpredictable, but it doesn't have much that helps you understand the building as a, uh, as a whole, but also in its, in its subcomponents. So if you multiply them, you come up with the life scores. And you could think that from Salingaros' point of view, you can say this is really the quality of the facades. And as far as you know, people that have worked along this vein are concerned, it's a fairly objective measure of how likely they are to engender a sense of, of again, repose, but also admiration, or the opposite, in the average human being. And so you can see that, unfortunately, 60 Queen Victoria Street, which is really, really an appalling building, yeah. Yeah. scores really low. The Crédit Lyonnais one scores better, predictably. Um, number one, poultry is a bit big, because it's got a lot of life, but it's also a bit piggledy-piggledy, you know? It's not a building that's obviously 
you know, it's difficult to know what, what, what occurs in some of these different bits. You know, it's got a lot of sculptural elements. And buildings aren't sculptures. They're buildings. They're different things. And, you know, uh, some of the older buildings score quite well, with the Albert building scoring particularly high. You remember that. So life was temperature times harmony. So you, you want to maximize both. And complexity is temperature times the lack of harmony. And so what we see here is buildings that perhaps might be interesting, but also a little bit disturbing or a little bit uh, that, that, that emphasize the sympathetic response as opposed to the parasympathetic response to a great extent. And you can see on that, number one poultry scores very highly. And even the National Safe Deposit and the Albert Building score a bit higher. Whereas these buildings, you know, they're not going to, you know, it's going to sleep any, lose any sleep over these. They're, they're just kind of there. So that's, that's the concept of, of this approach. And I think it's an interesting one you know, the people that really are interested in architecture can, can play with this and come up with different grades or different buildings. But it's not a bad thing to do uh, as an exercise when I mean, you're trying to understand, not just to come up with a number, but you're trying to understand what it is about a certain building or a certain room or a certain square with several buildings around it that you like or don't like. I think some of these metrics are kind of interesting. Either the end all and be all, they won't be, and different people have different opinions. So if I had to, my own personal qualitative comment is that the life score, uh, the overall quality score for 60 Queen Vit and Cali Lyonnais, it's not that different. Uh, I think most people, you know, are at least amused by the Cali Lyonnais one. It's not offensive, you know. Um, only people that are paid to be shows for architects seem to really like six Queen stuff. I mean, that's, that's not really true. Some people obviously do like it. But I think it's generally a less likable. It's a, it's a more looming building. Um, but neither of them is going to be very, very memorable. If you had a street of buildings similar to these, you know, it'd be a fairly dull street, especially in a grade A. Similarly, uh, I wanted to compare these two buildings because there are some similarities. And they both have a good score overall. But they're quite different buildings. This is a very historicist neoclassical buildings, and this is a postmodern. And I, I showed them compared to one another because I wanted to bring up this idea of, you know, th th there is a personal, there is a subjective or relate to this. And, and you know, to use a, a psychologist speak, somebody who's high in the trait of openness would probably like this building more than this building. They'll find this building a bit boring and a bit samey. Lots of buildings like that, and this one really sticks out. And, and perhaps somebody who is a bit more conservative in their aesthetic taste would find this a bit much. It's a building that shouts, you know. Uh, the thing I would say too is that, again, if you think about scalability, if you have several buildings of this ilk along a street, that's a perfectly decent street. If you had several buildings, <laughs> but not identical, but of this type, one after the other, that would be a lot. And so that raises the issue of, should an architect build a building that other people aren't allowed to build? You know, um, if, 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 if you dress well and you dress well, you're not canceling each other out. But if we dress in such a way, if I dress like I don't know, some kind of crazy multicolored clown and several of us do it, it, it starts to look a bit silly, right? So there's that. Now, you know, a few landmark buildings are arguably good for a neighborhood, for a city. But it, it, it's, it is something that we can, to some degree, hold against the building that it's fine as long as you don't do it very often, right? Uh, it's a bit like Dr. Seuss, actually, that building. Actually. <laughs> too many of them. Yes. Yeah, I think some drugs may have been taken. <laughs> uh, and again, on the qualitative aspect, as opposed to the purely quantitative, you know, I, I, I prefer this building. I prefer a National Provincial Bank to, um, to the Albert Buildings, although the Albert Buildings score slightly higher. They both score very highly. And I think if you have buildings that are scoring on the upper end or in the middle of this distribution, you know, can you say with exact you know, scientific precision that one is better than the other? It's debatable. But they both score very highly. 
And so I would say this is probably a bit more refined. Um, and this one perhaps is a little bit more freighted. But it also depends on what you bring to it, which is the, the po point of the last two or three slides you'll be happy to hear. I think this work that Professor Sonny Garris did is extremely useful, not just because we can come up with numbers and say this building is a 13, that building is a 12, but because the scientific basis, which I didn't go through, for, 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 for these, establishing these scores and selecting these characteristics, I think is strong, and certainly the strongest that I've seen in, in, in a couple of decades of reading about this stuff. It's certainly a lot better than the kind of criticism you read in the architectural magazines where somebody says, oh, this is very daring. How dare, you know, or this is interesting, or this is not interesting. You know, that's, that's very subjective. But there is an aspect of subjectivity that overlays all this. And, uh, you know, there's a famous line, which was repeated in a Woody Allen movie, but it's not from that, where somebody says, makes a comment about something being moral or immoral, and the other person says morality is subjective, and the other person says subjectivity is objective. I, what, what that means is that although we all have different subjective viewpoints, what, what produces those isn't some kind of magic from the sky. It's given by very real material historical uh, factors. So affect bias. You know, we have personal attachment and experience. And mine is different from yours, right? If you grew up in Scandinavia, somebody grew up in Morocco, um, the forms that they're familiar with and that they have associations and memories about will be different, presumably. And that's at the personal level. At the cultural or community level, the same thing is repeated, right? Uh, you know, we have different cultural and community memories. If you're British, you have a different take on the British Empire, on average, than if you're Nigerian or Indian, right? And within that, there are different propensities, right? A lot of people nowadays, one of the big, really big uh, topics in, in all kinds of humanities, and certainly in architectural history, is decolonialization. And that wasn't invented just by people that had been colonized, but, but by the former colonizers. So there are plenty of people that have what you might call oikophobia, which is a fancy term for a tendency to dislike and, and, and question what is yours, your traditions, your history. And some people have the opposite, right? So, you know, generally speaking, generally speaking, people that are more conservative bent will tend to value and appreciate at least parts of their tradition just because it's theirs. And vice versa, progressive people tend to question it more and, and, and want to expose maybe some of the weak bits. So you bring that to, to looking at a building beyond these factors. And then f finally, there's just personality. You know, some people clearly prefer more stimulus of one type and, you know, and, and some more of another. And, uh, you know, when you say to people, you, know, you, can't, you know, one of the, we'll talk about this in the presentation in December, you know, one of the critiques of, of minimalist modernism is nobody likes it, which is clearly not true. Some people really do like it. And so then the next step for people that hate modernism is, which is a silly step, is, well, then you're crazy if you like that. Now, you're not crazy. You just have a different opinion. You have a different personality. You may like uh, predictability and order and certain types of stimulus less than another person. And just to give you an example of both effect bias and effect of memory. So if you go to um, Venice, and you stand on St. Mark's Square, you look towards Giudecca, you can see St. George and Christ the Redeemer. They're both by Palladio, they're very beautiful. And when the sun shines upon them, you know, it's quite a sight. And uh, a few years ago, I went there with my daughter, and I was a bit emotional about this. And so she said, you know, she was a bit shocked, you know, why is dad getting emotional? And so I said, well, I really like these buildings, you know, they're part of our history. But then I wrote her this little thing. This is what I sent her, which is probably a bit maudlin, and you can see where my leanings are on the ecophilia, ecophobia side of things. Uh, but that's, that's the way I feel about this. And I think it's something that is difficult to quantify using the methodology that we just showed you. you know, that's <coughs> but it's objective in the sense that it is something that moves a lot of people. And so it's something to perhaps consider when you tear down a building, or equally, when you stop people from building new buildings that may have a different point of view. And that's the other bit of the same thing. That's the interior. And that's it. Mm -hmm.
questions? Any questions? Of course, Bob. Peter. Yeah. yeah. And soldiers in the Bank of England, which was throwaway line. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the PK ended in 72 or 74, I think it was. But they'd marched over 100 years, they'd marched from their barracks to the Bank of England every night. Um, after um, some riots during when Wellington's premiership. Right, right. I can't remember. But PK. They only ended it, and that, just like these kind of traditions in the army that just go on and on because no one will stop them. Uh, it, it ended in 74. But they used, I never saw it, but they marched through the city of London to the Bank of England every night. Um, secondly, it, this, this isn't really a question or even a comment. It's just completely <laughs> circumnavigating <laughs> everything that was said. In the, I, I studied architecture my whole life, and only recently did I get it. Um, if you... If you Abandon any reference to architecture. Excuse me, you're not simple. They'll think about Queen and Terry or Augustus Cudi or something like that, and they'll get hung up about it. But if you say to somebody, uh, I, I, "Can you just arrange a party?" People will know how to arrange a party with just a room or a picnic, but typically it's a blanket or chairs. But if you say, "What would your ideal party look like if you had a big budget?" And say, "Well, I'd have a swimming pool and a wood fire." And uh, I'd have it in hanging gardens, and you just arrange it so that it all flowed down to a, a centre, so you could sit around the fire and pool or foam, whether it was winter or summer. And you just engage what people know and understand about having a party. And a, a village or a town or a city is just a larger party, and that's what engages people. The opposite of that is something like a military camp, where everything's parked in architecture, uh, architecturally concentric terms. Or a station, a railway station, where the last thing you want is but it's just there to, to organise flow of objects. So most so you, want, you don't want everyone stuck in one yeah, place. Exactly. Right? Uh, it, so most people do understand architecture; they just don't know that they do. Because he said, look, can you organise a party? People will grow what wouldn't work and what would work. They quickly arrange furniture. That's all you have to arrange to make it more like a party, and that would go with everything, even the furnishings. As soon as you start mentioning architecture. People get hung up because they, they don't understand Doric, Ionic, composite, and I've missed one. Um, sure, and, sure, yeah. And, and, and things like that. And it's nothing to do, that's largely irrelevant. Uh, but but if you just say organize a party, they definitely do know how to do it. You that. know, all professionals use a lot of jargon to make themselves, you know, so you, you well, talk about massing and, and, and voids and, and volu volu volumetry. You know, it's like, yeah, okay. It's so just how you ask the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can, you can start quantifying it, but you're going to have the same answer, which is how, how do we organise a party? Milton Keynes is a perfect example of how, how not to organise a party. Islamabad, Canberra, uh, places I've like been so, to a party in Milton Keynes. Yeah. Keep so, that to yourself. This will not lead to rule. I, I think one of the reasons, so, so, so if you remember, I don't know if, how many of you guys saw the, 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 the presentation in about Christopher Alexander. So Christopher Alexander arrived at this through that kind of analysis. He observed that there were places, most villages, For most old towns, that responded to local conditions, local materials, local way of life, and then organically, it's called emergence, right? Like, mm -hmm. nice, nice term again. You, know, you make a few rules, and then from that you get a very complex thing, so you have this emergent process. And he described it in detail, and he came up with some ideas and rules behind it, and so it was kind of an intuitive uh, process in the way that it works, in fact, uh, you know, amongst normal people. Um, I think what San Garros has done is very useful because, although I, I tend to agree with what you're saying, if you go in front of a professional audience, not necessarily an architect or the architects, but the planners, people that, committees that, that you know, um, um, sanction a building or, or order a building, or a large corporate entity, and you say, well, you know, it's kind of it will percolate from the will of the people, and, you know, you just complete, you know, that's it. You know, the curtain goes down, you know, don't call us, we'll call you. Whereas if you take an approach that is more based, arguably, in science, is more quantifiable, I think that creates a way of dialoguing with the reality of how buildings get built and how you know, uh, you know, a town's got planned. If you look at new, so-called new urbanism, new urbanism started off again from Christopher Alexander and people like him, and saying, you know, everybody loves going 
to Montmartre and everybody hates the town you built, let's build it more like that. Yeah. And that was, yeah, okay. But it didn't really work. And when they started actually putting it in, in more technical terms and more, in more sort of professional sounding terms, they had a great success. And even though I think in architecture we're still very much stuck in the middle of the 20th century, if you look at new developments in London, you know, they've completely taken out the religion of new urbanism. So that mixed use, mixed height, not too tall relative to, you know, right? Uh, yeah, actually, you know, multiple access, so, you know, yes, cars, great, but also pedestrians, bikes, blah, blah, blah. blah. So that, that battle, I think, has been more or less won, or perhaps in some cases to excess. Uh, but I think, I think from, the, from the point of view of the aesthetics of buildings, they're still in the profession, there's still this view that it's beyond, it's beside the point. Yeah, I agree. And it isn't. It, architecture is just, it's just, it, it starts with a line, which is a street, and a square. It's not a great start for a party. So in, invariably, you will you will start with uh, towards architecture, not towards parking. We've got a few parties that are starting with lines, but that's another point. Um, yes. Yes. Well, the squares. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the square, yeah. Um, unlike the roundabout. Um, a couple of quick points. I really like the whole shebang, except for your appalling raising of the uh, Credit Leon building, which is one of the buildings in the city. And one of the reasons which the point the structure doesn't really cover is there's no contrast compare with other buildings of its type. So I would argue the National Safety Deposit Building is Parisian pastiche and not particularly brilliant. And there's a lot of it about in central London of its of its period. It was the fashion copy of the Third Empire. Um, Pitch rooms are a go-go all around Hoban and much of the city that wasn't destroyed by our Germanic friends. Um, all the six I know Indeed. Um, and also, in the case of poultry, it's an impossible building inside. You get the bar on the top floor, you can't actually see anything because actually it's not higher than the old rounds. So you have no view doesn't work. It's impractical, except for people jumping off. So yeah, yeah, the one people get thrown themselves off. Exactly, yeah. yeah. There was, when was when I was there regularly in the, the noughties, it was, it was a port. Uh, Friday nights were, were not fun on occasion. Um, is that people remember, I don't, because I'm not that old, nor do I remember the pickets of the Bank of England, but the previous Mappen and Webb building that was knocked down and was a real triumph, so people said. Um, a lot of people supported that. Uh, and and so, so there's just nothing in the structure for me where it loses it is because my emotions, which you came on to the end, are actually geared to, well, what was there before? Ah, what, what are similar to it? How does it fit in? I like Red Leon Leonais because it is a reverse wedding cake. So it makes me think of some brides down on Fleet Street, which is many centuries older. And I also think it's a really good aspect. Can you bring your reference and that looking at the building per se, not everyone would have? Sure, but the city is full of glass boxes. That's a, when your real surname is Pilkington, you get nervous about glass buildings. But it's got a structure around it that makes it really different. And it's got a wonderful facade, and I, I think it's better than the other uh, Victorian building. For the, anyway, who cares what I think? But no, no. it's the contrast to compare thing and the practicality of it doesn't quite. So find one its important way thing is to you know all of this, and it's a limitation of any really, I think um, aesthetic judgment is that if you look at a facade or the outside of a building, it may be great or, or terrible inside, right? Um, Pre, so, so pre-post aesthetic, so aesthetic architecture, the idea was that you, you, you get your building built for yourself. Presumably you determine how it's built inside. You like it, you don't like it, that's your problem. Very few people go inside that building. Lots of people go past the building. And you're imposing that building on the rest of the community. And therefore, those aesthetics have a value or, or should be considered in a way that you know, fits in you know, with the rest of the neighborhood, with, 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 with a number of considerations. But it's very true that a lot of buildings that we, we may admire from the outside might not be so admirable inside, and vice versa. Um, but uh, you use the word pastiche. And so it's an interesting word, pastiche, because, well, it's a very modernist word. Right? It's basically saying, if it looks like something we've done before, 
that to some degree devalues it. So that's not, it's not a neutral word. It's a loaded word. I used word. it in the negative. Right? <laughs> and so um, I could say, I didn't, but I could say that uh, the Cadillonia building is memoryless. It could be anywhere. It could be built in any continent. Uh, it has no reference to who we were, who we are, where we might want to go, other than where we want to go is anywhere except where we've been. So it's a teenager's building. But I think it's more, I think I'm more balanced with it to be say, it's a functionalist building. It's not referential. It only references itself. And, and, and different people will have an idea whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So uh, I would say a more balanced term for the say deposit building is that it's historicist. It's very markedly historicist. Um, but that, that's just my choice of words. Any other questions or, or points before I get a beer? In a, in a similar way, we, if you distance yourself from, from, from the theory in the same way we've done it with, with, with the party and the architecture, if you go to art galleries and don't talk, start talking about art, if you, if you start talking about art, people start looking at the little tab on the left trying to understand what it's about, trying to be modern, <coughs> and they'll just be not sure what's going on. If, it's, if you just do a thought experiment where you've inherited this giant slosh in Bavaria and it's empty, uh, and you've got to, 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 to decorate it, Right straight through the National Gallery. That, that, no, 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 yes, 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 I'll take a lot. Right? If you just do that, then it's it, much easier to think about art in the you like and you don't. Uh, in the same way, it's easy to think about the party compared to a uh, 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 facade of a building. It's just, but if you abandon the theory, people immediately engage with what their instincts are rather than start looking at the tab and wondering what will be telling yes. things like that. I mean, that's I think theory has a, has a use, but it, 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 should, it should be perhaps articulated in such a way that it's not, you know, with, with dogma. Yeah, you know. Guardian with a buzzword, exclusion. But, you know, you, the, point, the, point, the point that you raised, um, you know, is a very interesting one. Um, because a few years, a couple of, two or three years ago, someone posted on, on social media about this great ruthless building. And like many people, but not all by any means, I think the brutalist buildings are, you know, I, I don't respond well to brutalist. I, I, I don't like how they work. I don't like how they relate to the rest of the city, and so on and so forth. And so I was going to write something, I would either write nothing or something slightly snide. And then I thought, that's not really interesting or useful. I mean, I already know that, I, that, I, that, that brutalist buildings are a crime against humanity in my, in my little head. But these people are not bad people, they're not idiots, they're not ignorant. And so I just said, what, what do you specifically like about it? And I got some interesting answers, including from, 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 from Minna, who's a yeah. big fan of um, British architecture. Um, it was just something that I think, it, well, she hadn't posted it, but it, was someone, it might have been someone who was a sure and I. It just posted a picture of a building and said, oh, we really love it, and all that. And so I asked them, they came up with some answers. And the answers were very interesting, because they really played to this Factor. I don't know if I can go back to the presentation. It doesn't matter. That last slide about different personalities and a different effect. You know? Because the things that they said that they liked about it were true. It's just that they don't think, I, I didn't, it wasn't that they hadn't understood what they were about, those buildings. This is just a very long winded way to get to the second to the last. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. They said it's uncompromising. It's completely new. It's, sorry, never mind. It's a break from the past. It's 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 um, it, well, it was at the time though, right? These were like 50s, 60s buildings. It's uh, so they listed a number of reasons why they like that building. Now, to me, a compromising is a bad thing. Anything that doesn't compromise, other than you know, I don't know, protecting your children if something something destroyed it, is is pure, pure. You know, life is a constant compromise. The, the alternative to compromise is, isn't some kind of way to tame it, it's constant conflict. Yeah, that's the only alternative to compromise. I, I think your national safety deposit building is a compromise. It is. 
It's a Victorian Parisian the, building. So, so the compromise is good. So uncompromising no. to me isn't great, but to them it was a reason to like this building. And so, you know, uh, it becomes more interesting then, right? Rather than to say, well, you're crazy because you like the pretty linear building. I'm actually interested in the things that you like about it. And there may be reasons that I don't find convincing in the same way that you don't find convincing my reasons for liking the you know, National Plaza building, which is not a fantastic building, but it's a, it's a decent building. It's a reasonable building. Um, and I think that's a more useful exchange, trying to understand why you know, people really love, um, tr uh, what is it, Trollic Tower. Trollic Tower, you know, there's some mugs with it and t-shirts. Uh, at the time it was built, it was very controversial, as you know. People, you know, generally people disliked it, but it's become much more popular. And, uh, you know, uh, Trollic Tower, at yes, just on the canceled. edge of North Dotting Hill, by Erna Goldfinger. The huge concrete sill, and then, uh, and then the uh, service uh, core is on the side of it, right. linked by oh, little causeways to this floor. Uh, right. So, you know, it has a fan base. And you can't say that everybody that likes that, you know, didn't get architecture is stupid. But, but it's interesting to examine why they like it, and there are reasons that for many people, I would say probably for the majority of people, certainly for me, don't amount to a good reason to like a building, but I have to recognize that they're very real reasons, and that, you know, that it's a listed building, people aren't going to tear it down, um, and, uh, you know, there's a waiting list to live there. Same with the Barbican, right? I mean, to me, the Barbican is dystopia. Not so much the buildings, is the way it's organized, right? Yeah. The multi-level stuff, yeah. uh, you know. I think they're, well, that's a different discussion again, but you know, this kind of idea of working the level and segregating access um, is problematic. But, you know, people that, I know people that live there that love it, and I think it's brilliant for a number of reasons, and you know, right? Yeah. It's even worse with the French uh, insisted on building brutalism in, in Stevens. Uh, Flame and Lazar, Pixel Crown is there, Team, Balfouron. It's actual brutalism, slightly worse even than the, the Barbican, right in the middle of the skew Admittedly, they were new and there wasn't really a one for them. But it's a disaster, it's even worse to build them there than it was on the bomb side, which was the Barbican, which was completely other. So, if you want to look at the true abomination, at least in the city of London, I've done a fair amount of photographic research into how much was destroyed. It's kind of an exaggeration that every modern building in this country was due to the Luftwaffe. But the, the Barbican was, because that yeah, so was the, the architects, the, yeah. And I would say if you take the gold, the, the, what is it, the Golden Lane Estate and the Barbican, I would say, I'm spit more here because I, there was a lot of gold there. But there was about 50% of that. The other 50%. I, think, I think it's a higher figure between Norgate and. I, I, I've got photographs of the structure. That, uh, that area was a, was a kind of not particularly good area of the city in terms of values, as the other buildings were very, very, very tired and they weren't exceptional buildings. But it's what I'm saying is there was, a, there was a fair amount of demolition. But, but there was most a lot of things. London was like that. Yeah, and a lot of things, you know, buildings aren't either leveled or intact. Right? They kept the church, the church was damaged, they kept that. They fixed it. Yeah. Right? Since even since even jewelry, if you look at the pictures after the bombing, I mean it looks pretty rough. You know, I was in there just this afternoon. It's immaculate. Yeah. So you know, there, there there were lots of good reasons at the time for people to think that there were large swathes of very old buildings that, especially then, were yeah, damaged. Think knocking things down was one of the reasons that we get brutalism. That, that it was good to talk well, about. They're, they're linked, they're linked but, but the, the Victorians are the same thing. You know, they, they, they routinely exactly. said, this area is falling to bits, yep. hasn't been well maintained, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's obsolete, let's, you know, let's substitute it with something else. And if you've had a lot of damage on top of that, you know, um, it's Nobody actually the same way. If, if you watch the lower the, part, if you, watch, if you watch, I think it's the Land of the Hill mark, which I think is 1946 or 7, uh, with, um, it's Alec Guinness, and he works in the Bank of England, and it's all about robbing the gold. Um, there's lots of scenes on, on what is now the dual carriageway of Lower Thames Street, and all around Queen Victoria right. Street, and you yeah. see how many buildings have gone. It's the pause is on its own. Yeah. Yeah. There is nothing there. Yeah. It is rubble. No, that's a good uh, and, and that's, well, I would say, that's, 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 that
1940s film. The, the, in fact, sure. the city after an early one in immaculate Victorian 1855-1865 square by the River of Pimlico, except for the German bomb that hit number 6872, and they, they don't just put up, I don't know if it was built in the 50s and the 60s, but I can't see it, it's on my side of the square. That's why I like scary, that you but live it, in the streets to live in the Agnes building. Yeah. <laughs> because you can't see it. That was Prince Charles, yeah. that was Prince Charles yeah. yeah. from the London Hilton, he said the great advantage of dining at the London Hilton restaurant is you cannot see, see the London, the London Hilton, Hilton from the top. So you, you, there's, there's an advantage in that. No, there's, there's the presentation a presentation in December will be about some of the 20th century modernisms, and I will talk about briefly about briefly because there's a plethora of different styles about brutalism. I found some nice pictures of, of brutalist buildings to suit all tastes. We can, we'll have to put a trigger warning as it were, the Guardian readers on that one. Um, no, the Guardian readers, they love it. Oh, they love I'm it. From okay. Sheffield, trigger I'm warning. from Sheffield. They built the New Jerusalem there. Caution contains oh, images of brutalist architecture which may make you burst into tears. <laughs>